No, there we go. Yes. Uh, so, hi everybody. Uh, thank you for having me here. I'm Alex. I come from Cisco Talos Vulnerability Research Team. Um, I'm a senior security researcher there. These gentlemen on the left are my colleagues. Uh, my team is led by Ad Yonan and Richard Johnson. Uh, and we've grown a bit in the recent years. Uh, I get asked a lot about what we actually do, and most of our research or our work is third-party vulnerability research. We find vulnerabilities in popular commodity software. And in the last year, we published over uh, 170 vulnerabilities in different, different vendors. Uh, Besides that, we obviously do focus on a lot of fuzzing, triaging, vulnerability analysis, and uh, automating those topics in general. Uh, our other branches include mitigation development, and our whole team focus is on open source stuff, and we tend to open source all tools or research, which you can usually find on our website or on our GitHub page. What I'm going to talk about today is uh, guided fuzzing and applying guided fuzzing on the binaries that we don't have source code for. So in order to do that, I'm going to give you a quick overview of guided fuzzing with AFL, a quick overview of Dinan's framework, which is sort of tangential to what we're doing here, uh, overview of AFL Dininst, which is a tool that we've developed to do so, uh, time permitting a couple of bugs that I found during the last year, and I'll conclude with a couple of takeaways for, for this talk. So AFL, or starting with guided fuzzing, dumb fuzzing is where you just take a sample, mutate it in some way, throw it against the target, see if it crashes. Take a sample, mutate it, throw it against the target, see if it crashes, and doing that ad infinitum. You don't have any feedback from the application to see if you're advancing in any way or when you should actually stop doing whatever you're doing. Uh, early steps in guided fuzzing include corpus distillation. So starting with thousands and thousands of files, how do you know which files actually test new paths inside the process that you're testing, which are actually beneficial to your testing and which are not? Uh, to do that, people have been developing tools that work uh, using PIN framework or, or Dynamorio, which usually just record basic block coverage and then use that to minimize the corpus to the most interesting files. Some of the more interesting fuzzers based on this guided fuzzing approach, early steps in this approach were EFS, or Evolutionary Fuzzing System, uh, which in background used PyMay Process Stalker, which in background relied on debugging to actually record the, the paths taken inside the process execution. Uh, and not to dig too into it, a uh, comprehensive overview of guided fuzzing can be found in my uh, research leads presentation, uh, Go Speed Tracer, which Rich Johnson gave at Hack in the Box this year and Recon this summer. The talk is recorded somewhere, so it's a good reference for all of the guided fuzzing. Moving on to the actual state of the art with fuzzing in general, and especially in guided fuzzing, uh, currently, the most popular tool is American Fuzzy Lop, which comes with a nice and courses GUI, old style kind of GUI you can see here on the picture. It has a bunch of information that can actually tell you how well your fuzzer is doing. And uh, as Ben Nudge would say, it's a fractal of good design decisions. So every single design decision AFL has taken is good. They did everything right. What it does is compile time instrumentation, so it adds the information that gives you feedback during compile time. It chooses a really simple genetic algorithm to, uh, to advance its corpus and uh, find new paths through the program. Uh, Zalewski actually went through and tested all the mutation strategies and kept only the ones that work and not the theoretical ones. It's high performance and it's easy to use. So one of the core, some of the core ideas of AFL are starting with first compile time instrumentation. First iteration of this was in, implemented as an uh, added GCC plugin or added uh, pass with GCC, 
which instrumented uh, added instrumentation during assembly process. Second iteration used the Clang, uh, Clang instrumentation, which had added LLVM pass, which actually allows you to be more, uh, to be faster, to optimize your code and whatnot. Uh, and the main takeaway from this during the compile time instrumentation is that it achieves really, really fast execution and a fraction of the slowdown compared to native execution. Uh, the second idea is that instead of doing just the basic block coverage, here in FL we're doing uh, edge transition tracing. So uh, whenever we transition from one basic block to a second basic block, we record that as a transition so we can distinguish how we got to the second block because a block, one block can have multiple targets and that's actually important here. And the instrumentation that's being added into in front of every basic block to simplify things in the compile, compiled binary is looks something like this. Uh, the current location, the current ID of the basic block is generated at random. Uh, we have a piece of shared memory which we just mark as a bitmap with the, at the value of the current location XOR with the previous location. And in that way, we get the path transition, which is what we want. And the last line that says previous location equals current location shifted by one just lets us have a sort of a count of uh, how many times we've entered the loop or something like that. Uh, all of these are recorded into a relatively small bitmap, which is lightning fast to compare uh, because you want to compare them again and again and again to know which ones are better and which words are not. So that's really important. And uh, another performance bonus that AFL has is this thing called fork server. So what it does when it starts the process, it injects a forking daemon inside at the start of the process. It forks an image and because on Linux systems or on other systems, fork is implemented as copy and write, uh, it, you, we actually get a new process for free. Uh, nothing gets copied, no memory gets uh, actually, no physical memory gets copied, so we, it's pretty fast to create new processes that way. Uh, how do we actually use AFL? First thing that you want to do is get a bunch of files and select favorites. AFL does that by executing each of the test cases that you throw at it against the target, records the bitmap, compares the bitmaps, and keeps the only interesting ones. The on, uh, only keeps the ones that actually add to the process coverage, add new code to the, to the, to the bitmap. And if the two test cases have the same bitmap, uh, it takes the smaller one and the faster one. So it prioritizes small and fast test cases because test cases that take too long can be somewhat more interesting, but they cost you a lot because here we're doing genetical uh, algorithm and slow test cases cost you a lot with each generation. After it selects the favorites, it mutates favorites first deterministically one by one with their deterministic algorithms, then then proceeds to uh, mutate them with some uh, random algorithms. While doing that, new paths inside the process will get triggered, which means we get new new test cases, uh, which we can then later later on use, add to our queue and fuzz, still mutate them, spreading the, the total coverage of the whole corpus and getting a better corpus and better results. And it basically does that until you tell it to stop. It just never stops. Uh, the main things that people have understood from using AFL that speed is crucial because here we're doing brute force vulnerability uh, discovery. We need to push as many test cases as we can per second to the target in order to trigger interesting vulnerabilities, especially in complex, complex already tested targets uh, that can be hard. So many, many executions is what we want. Uh, it's better to throw away big and slow inputs, as I already said, because they cost you a lot. Uh, also, in whole its design and use, uh, KISS principle is employed. Keep it simple, stupid. So it's really easy to use, no fancy algorithms, no symbolic execution engines, solvers, theorem improvers, or whatnot. It's just brute force with a really simple algorithm. 
there is only one down, downside to AFL by itself, though, and that is that it only works if you've got source code to instrument the application that we're trying to test, which is good enough. There's plenty of open source software, and people have been basically finding vulnerabilities with AFL in pretty much everything. But there have been attempts to make it work against binaries, against uh, binary blobs for which we don't have any kind of software reference or whatnot. Uh, well, some of those were first implemented in PIN, which is horribly slow for this kind of purpose. Uh, next iteration with Dynamorio, which is kind of better, but still not there. Uh, the problem with these two is that they're dynamic instrumentation frameworks, and they re-instrument the binaries each time. In case of Dynamoria, you can't get to the instrumentation cache and optimize it in some way, but in the case of PIN, that's just not exposed to you. And the one thing that did work and does work is AFL QEMU, which uh, leverages QEMU's uh, user mode instrumentation. So when you run the binary through QEMU, it adds a bunch of instructions during the translation layer there. Uh, it's fast, faster than the previous two, but it's still far, far away from native execution speed. And the additional problem is that we either fuzz uh, or either trace only the main binary or we trace everything. So by that, I mean we trace all the shared libraries that are used by the binary, which is sometimes not what we want. We want to target a specific binary. I rarely want to f actually fuzz libmath or libc. I want to fuzz libt for libjpeg or something like that. Uh, a small detour. Uh, what I'm actually talking about, a tool that I'm actually talking about, relies on this Dinance framework, which is similar in vision to PIN or Dynamorio, but with one crucial, di uh, crucial difference. It's also a binary modif instrumentation analysis, modification, performance monitoring tool. It comes out of uh, University of Maryland, University of Wisconsin. Uh, the main difference with Dynamoria compared to Dynance uh, compared to Dynamoria or PIN is that it does static binary rewriting, where with Dynamoria we instrument the binaries during runtime. With Dynance we can lift the binary, analyze it add the instrumentation that we want into places that we want, repackage the binary and write it back to disk. What that allows us to do is instrument once and then run the instrumented binary multiple, multiple times, which is really a lot faster than, than previous. It has uh, pretty much support for all the instruction sets, the whole instruction set for x86 and AMD64, uh, full Linux, uh, full Linux support and partial win Windows support. They keep telling me it's getting there, but it's still not there. Um, the problem with this is that it has some false positives and false negatives, because doing the static analysis, uh, the core problem in doing the static binary rewriting is recovering the control flow graph of the binary. So what you want to do is Read the, read the binary, find all the code inside the binary, find all the functions, all the basic blocks and whatnot. And that's not a simple, simple problem because we have uh, in our binaries, in our Intel platforms and whatnot, uh, we have mixed code and data in the same, in the same regions. And that's not an easy, easy problem to solve. And will we'll sometimes result in uh, false positives or false negatives. What it does really good is uh, that it has a robust instrumentation API, which is really simple to use and allows you to, uh, has great granularity. So you can basically hook the functions, you can do basic block in, uh, level instrumentation or even instruction level instrumentation. So uh, full freedom of what you want to do. In order to instrument the binary, uh, the idea is to read the binary, build a control flow graph of it, and then walk that graph, find the code that you want, add the instrumentation in places that you want, and the, write it back to disk. Uh, the execution is, fast, is faster, mostly because we still get to use the instruction cache, which doesn't get evicted each time we branch to, uh, to instrumented code, or uh, the principle of lo code locality is somewhat more preserved than in other frameworks. Uh, as I mentioned, 
drawbacks are that it can sometimes fail and it's not really working well on Windows code. Enter to the AFL Dininst. So I found out that Dininst would be a perfect framework to write an AFL-like tool which would add uh, similar to AFL instrumentation into already compiled binaries, which I could then use with vanilla AFL to fuzz for vulnerabilities. Uh, we get as close as we can to the native speed, still slower than vanilla AFL, but really, really fast, much faster than QEMU, which we will see in the demo. It has support for fork server, and compared to FL QEMU, you can actually pick and choose which parts of the code you want to instrument, which libraries, which binaries, uh, which comes really useful when fuzzing different applications. And we usage example here shows uh, just a list of options that you can do. You have an input and output binary, you can list libraries that you want to instrument, even external libraries which aren't detected automatically, just loaded at runtime or something like that, and a bunch of uh, debugging options and inputs. Uh, to see how it works, it's relatively simple. Uh, on one hand, we have this libfl dininst library, which gets injected into the target, target binary, which has basically two functions. One is uh, init AFL fork server, which actually injects the fork server that AFL needs to achieve its speed into the binary. It does that at the start, at the start of the text segment. So at the first instruction in the actual process, it jumps to the fork server and then forks from there, from there on. You can actually point it to main or some other point that you want, but that kind of tends to get tricky. And the second function is just the basic block callback. This is the function that gets called each time a new basic block is hit to record that edge transition that we want to. And recall that it's uh, similar as the AFL's instrumentation that I've previously shown. So that's the shared library, and this is the excerpt from the instrumentation tool. I'm not gonna go into details here much, but the point is that you start with the app binary, you iterate with the for loop through all the modules, inside the module you iterate through all the functions, and then for each function you, uh, instrument, you iterate through its uh, basic blocks, instrumenting them, and so on. When you're done with that, we add, uh, we insert a call to the fork server, and then just write the binary back to disk. And this is how we actually add the instrumentation. Uh, we walk the functions functions uh, flow graph, find each basic block, and uh, get a random ID for that basic block, build this kind of uh, function call expression, which we have here, which has a basic block random ID as an argument, which is the only argument to that function, that function being this basic block callback. Uh, we build a call to that function and just place it with, with this insert snippet code into the actual binary. So once that's done, you write the binary back to disk and you can run it as normal. So we can try and do a, see how it works, how it compares to uh, vanilla AFL or how it compares to QEMU in terms of speed. If luck should have it, just let's see. How will this work? Okay. So first, let's go with vanilla AFL. I already have it set it up here and just start it up. Is it starting? Oh, okay. How do I decrease the size here? The resolution is messed up, but I don't know my shortcuts. <laughs> um, okay, just a sec. Fourteen should be good enough. Ah, that's not good.
I messed up a bit there. But it's always the simple things that mess up the demos. Like, what did I do now? Kill the thing. Yeah. Probably. Okay, let's do it this way then. Uh, you can actually use it for other platforms, but I've only used it for Intel, so I'm not too familiar with it. But um, what if I? Okay, I'll know what we'll do. I'll do it this way. Ah, here we have this one. Let me do the thing. Uh, this one is running the Dinan's instrumented binary, and we can see the execution speed of about uh, 1,600 executions per second. Uh, interesting thing to, thing to note is that we're getting new edges on the left, which is what you want, and we have map density or count coverage increasing constantly, which actually tells us that everything is working. Uh, so we bottom up around uh, thousand and a half or a thousand six hundred executions per second and compared to FLQ emu which I hope will let which I hope will start up again it's too small um, why Why it doesn't listen to me at all? No. Let's try again. It's a really silly option that it won't let me do it, but okay, I'll get the stats from a different uh, from a different way. You'll have to trust me on this that we can't show the the actual output, but if I cut out the stats. It should have the average speed, which is, where is it? Exact, executions per second is uh, 280, which is uh, five times less than with our AFL Dennis tool. Uh, so I'll just go back to presentation because the demos are costing me time. Uh, so one of the last things that I wanted to actually talk about is uh, some bugs that I found through, through this tool. Just run some numbers to, for you guys to see that it actually works. Uh, I focused sometime last year on fuzzing uh, some forgotten middleware SDKs, two of those being Oracle Outside In Technology, which is just a huge library or SDK with a bunch of parsers that actually parse everything you throw against them. Uh, hundreds of parsers in forgotten file formats. Uh, the problem is it's found almost everywhere. Exchange uses it for PDF preview, depending on the version. A bunch of AVs use it for PDF filtering, for content extraction, and for stuff like that. And the same deal is with HP Key View, which does the same thing, uh, but is found, on the other hand, in IBM Dominant or IBM Notes. Again, we in a bunch of AVs and document management systems. It's just uh, really old C code, which no one actually looks at a lot. Uh, given a month of fuzzing, month or two of fuzzing, and 12 cores, I ended up with thousands of crashes in the different file formats, some of which I've never heard before. Uh, this is actually what got me uh, working on automatic uh, crashes analysis or automatic triage, because I want to sort which bugs to actually look at. I don't want to look at thousands of crashes. Uh, after spending some time working on that, uh, I came up with around 20 vulnerabilities which have been patched throughout the year, throughout the last year. There are more incoming, uh, just waiting for Oracle to patch them. Uh, it's a similar case with KeyView, a lot of, a lot of bugs there. And it's a moot point with ownership as well because a lot of vendors that are actually shipping their binaries don't have the new licenses from HP and takes a while to update. So this is a short list of vulnerabilities that this tool found in the last year only in Oracle IoT. You can see the full list on our website. We'll be showing it at the end. 
uh, some of the funny bugs that it found to see that it actually can find relatively complex bugs is uh, this uh, one that I particu found particularly funny was this Unicode XML integer overflow. Uh, in this case, I was putting, fuzzing PDFs, and the fuzzer came up with itself with a, a XML file, which was exactly uh, 200, uh, uh, 1024 bytes plus one long and required this magic string at the beginning which turns out to be a unicode for the last n value which opens a, uh, opens up uh, an XML tag uh, and has a bunch of requirements so it mustn't have any of the less than or, or greater than in plain ASCII anywhere inside a file it must be a multiple of 2400 1024 bytes plus one byte long, and the fuzzer was actually seeded with nothing even remotely similar to this one. Uh, this other example is some sort of QP6 file format, which I have no idea what it is. Uh, I just know that if I throw this couple of bytes against IoT, uh, it will get me code execution. Uh, Fuzzer in this case was seeded with just an empty file. So it came up with this sequence of bytes on its own, just out of the blue, and came up with code execution or some sort of heap overflow against OIT framework, which is just ridiculous. Uh, one of my favorite examples from this fuzz run was the TIFF extra samples heap overflow. Uh, in order to, this is the original file, and this is the fuzz one. So there aren't many differences, but the, the differences that there are in the file need to be in precise spots, need to be in precise offsets, and in order to trigger this vulnerability, the fuzzer had to come up with the extra samples tag, which isn't present in the original file, to insert it, to make a properly sized, uh, properly sized tag information, uh, and in, in that doing hit a bunch of other parameters in order to actually trigger the overflow. Because if one of these parameters like bit per sample or sample per, per pixel do not work out, uh, the integer will just wrap and you won't hit the overflow. But if the, the values are pretty exact, you hit the overflow and, and you hit the integer overflow and you can mess up the, the memory and then further on lead to code execution. And just to wrap things up, some of the takeaways that I've got from the, a year of using this tool and a year of using AFL is that speed is crucial. We just want dump everything else, just focus on the speed. Every single hertz in your processor needs to be utilized if it scans. Uh, other thing is good por corpus is golden. So with a bunch of these test cases, I've started with a small corpus of files, grew it against different applications, and in the end got a corpus which I just really, really nicely groomed corpus which I can now just throw against a new application without even fuzzing it and see what sticks and usually get a bunch of crashes that way. And the third thing is be very specific with instrumentation. I don't want to target a bunch of libraries that other people are targeting. I want to target this particular functionality of the process that uh, I want to focus on. Uh, that would be it from my side. Thank you for having me here and thank you for listening to my talk. If you have any questions, I'll be around and I'm not sure how you're doing on time. But. Thank you very much.